Marston, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the St. Paul's Emergency Medicine Update Conference, which is combining with the BC Emergency Medicine Network to bring this webinar series. And the purpose is to, to uh, reinforce and to um, improve the uh, whole St. Paul's Emergency Medicine Update and Emergency Medicine Network experience. And we're, we're very fortunate to have as our speaker, uh, Dr. Grant Innes, who uh, many of you uh, know already uh, by his reputation and the amount of the his iconic stature in uh, emergency medicine in, in Canada. So uh, Grant uh, will present his uh, talk that he gave on in September at our um, Lister conference. And it's um, a book for an hour, and we're hoping that over the next hour we'll have some discussion. But uh, if you um, don't get a chance to ask your question, there is an opportunity on the BC Emergency Medicine Network to um, post a question following the, um, following the presentation. The presentation itself is being recorded and will be up within the next week uh, to the Emergency Medicine Network. So if uh, some of you know wasn't able to make it, um, they can go back and look at it or they go and look at it uh, within the next week. So, um, so Grant, uh, thank you very much for doing this. I, I would like to give a plug also to uh, CAPE 2018, which is in Calgary, and, and CAPE uh, is uh, being, you're, you're the scientific chair of that. So when are the dates for Calgary, uh, CAPE 2018? Uh, that's kind of a difficult question. I don't have my notes with me, but I think it's uh, May, tw May 26th to 30th, uh, roughly. Uh, Pre-conference pre -conference stuff on the Saturday of that week and the conference Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Perfect. Okay, so thanks. And sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, people, please uh, look online and, and find Cape 2018, and you can find the uh, what the details are there. So uh, think of going, uh, uh, going to uh, Calgary in May. So thank you very much, uh, Grant. I'll hand it over to you. Um, oh, one last thing. Uh, if you have a question, um, there are, besides your names, on the participant list. So if you open up the participant list, you'll see a hand icon. And uh, if you wish to ask a question, please just click on the hand icon. And uh, you then have to click on it uh, again to uh, delete it and, um, and take it off so you can ask another question. And Nick, I, I'm going to ask if you had a question. Um, and if you can't, uh, if you don't have your audio set up now, you can try to um, go through the chat room and uh, do it that way. And in the chat room, there's a phone number for the... Yes, I'll, I'll resend it okay. uh, to connect my audio. Okay, so if people want to check into the chat room and they can find the actual uh, phone number to call into, can they? That's right. Okay, so it'll be there. If you look in there, you can, if you want, wish to join by, um, um, by phone. So you can connect by your computer or by phone. All right, so that's enough talking for me. Uh, Grant, please take it away, and again, thank you. Well, thanks, Julian. Um, it's good you invited me to do this because it gave me a reason to get up this morning. Um, so anyway, I give a presentation most years at the Whistler Conference looking at what I think are the more interesting or useful uh, articles from the recent literature. Uh, and uh, this, uh, about a month ago, Julian told me he was desperate and somebody had canceled out. He couldn't get anyone else to present today, so he asked me if I could give this talk uh, once more. So the plan is to review some of the more useful literature from the last year uh, and what my uh, thoughts were about the article. Uh, hopefully most of these are either practice changing or somewhat interesting. And uh, I'm going to do them in a case-based format. So to start with, there is the uh, required disclosure slide. Uh, I actually don't get any money from anybody, uh, something that is maybe important. I'm not too smart. I actually was streamed into the vocational program in high school, but since then I've been a little bit like Donald Trump. I've achieved way beyond my intelligence. Uh, I might have a subconscious bias against drug companies because they never seem to want to give me any money and uh, journals won't, seem, won't publish my papers. But anyway, uh, we'll start with case one. This is uh, a 27-year-old woman who presents with some uh, chest pain. Um, and uh, this is... Uh, Actually, the point of this case is something I see about seven times every day. So this patient looks quite well, has an oxygen saturation of 99% room air, uh, and when you see her, she's 
on uh, oxygen and has uh, uh, is waiting for her troponin results to return. Uh, so knowing she doesn't need oxygen, you turn the oxygen off, but every time you return, you find the oxygen is once more flowing at two liters per minute. So we seem to have this sense that oxygen is terribly valuable for patients with chest pain. Uh, so when I was researching uh, oxygen, uh, I was so impressed by this ad for a home oxygen bar on Amazon that I bought one for myself. You can see all sorts of benefits, uh, calms your mind, reduces stress, and lessens the effects of chronic fatigue. So anyway, we know oxygen is amazing. We know that everyone in the emergency department should have oxygen and a monitor when they arrive in the emergency department. And sometimes it's hard to get patients off oxygen. Oddly enough, when scientists study oxygen, they rarely find any value. Um, a, a recent uh, Cochrane meta-analysis says that there's in fact no randomized trial evidence to support the routine use of oxygen for AMI, and, in, and we, we think that it may in fact be harmful. Okay, so that brings us to the, the first study. This is, this is a study published in the New England Journal in 2017. And these authors uh, noted that excessive oxygen saturations may cause coronary vasoconstriction and release oxygen uh, toxic free radicals. So they uh, decided that uh, they would randomize uh, patients to, um, and these are patients with suspected AMI, to receive uh, high flow oxygen or room air. So there's a study of 6,000 uh, normoxic patients. They had to have an oxygen saturation of more than 89%, um, so 90% or greater. And once randomized, they got oxygen uh, six liters for 12 hours, or they got placebo, which was just uh, room air through the prongs. So results, what did they find? Uh, almost half of the patients in this study had a STEMI. So this is actually a really high risk group of uh, patients. Uh, bottom line, if you look in the table, uh, no difference in death, reinfarction, or readmission, uh, whether patients got oxygen or uh, room air. And, uh, okay, so the groups, the groups were very similar in the intervention and control groups. Uh, the lack of an outcome difference was consistent across all the subgroups. And probably the uh, main concern with the study is that there was really very little difference in oxygen saturations uh, in the actual oxygen saturations that the patients had. So in the oxygen group, the average oxygen sat was 99%. In the control group, the room air group, the uh, oxygen saturation was 97%. So probably not enough difference uh, in oxygen saturations to lead to any change in outcomes. Uh, the, other uh, possible concern about this study was that the clinicians who treated the patients were not blinded, but uh, death and reinfarction are fairly hard outcomes, uh, and these weren't uh, determined uh, by clinicians. They were determined by blinded evaluators. So actually, it's not a bad study, uh, clearly published in a pretty good journal. And I think the bottom line is that Oxygen is useful to treat hypoxia, uh, but it's not useful to treat MI. And one concern I always have, because I probably get into trouble several times a year when I try and discharge a patient who seems fine, and the oxygen that I didn't realize was on the patient is removed, and then the patient desats into the 80s uh, and needs a bunch of investigation. So one concern I have about every patient getting oxygen is that it masks uh, sicker patients. We sometimes your audio has been muted. Press star six to unmute your audio. Okay, so let's move on to the next case.
pretty common sort of a thing. This is an 11-year-old girl who injures her ankle playing soccer. She's got some isolated findings, uh, tenderness and swelling over the lateral malleolus, and she won't weight bear. She has normal x-rays. So uh, I'm what sorry, would you recommend? Grant. And so here I'll get everybody to put their hands up. Uh, who would recommend a tensor and crutches? Okay, not too many for that. Activity as tolerated. Okay, there's a few. Uh, cast boot. We assess in seven to ten days. Okay, so lots of people want to do that. So I'm making this up. Of course, I can't see anybody. Um, <laughs> so I was taught uh, in medical school, and I think most of us were probably taught, that when you see a swollen ankle or a swollen wrist for the that matter in a child, that children don't get sprains, that they're more likely to fracture, and therefore that these x-ray negative injuries are generally Salter 1 fractures of the epiphysis. Uh, as a result of this teaching, uh, probably most of these kids end up in casts and overly immobilized for a week or maybe several weeks. And so this is actually a, a nice study in a big journal from a very good Canadian researcher, uh, Amy Clint. And what they did was uh, quite simple. I wish I would have done it. Uh, they did uh, MRs in kids who had clinical sprains or suspected Salter 1 fractures. Um, so uh, 135 uh, kids age 5 to 12 uh, suspected Salter 1 fractures of the lateral uh, ankle. And what did they find on the MRs? What they found, if I can get the slide to change, there we are. They found that actually uh, only 3% of these kids had a fracture. So 97% of these Salter 1 fractures were not Salter 1 fractures. They were either bone contusions or sprains. And um, so what, what this suggests to me is that if it looks like a sprain, it probably is a sprain, and we should be putting way fewer uh, kids into immobilization, uh, treating, uh, treating them more conservatively with uh, ice and uh, activation as tolerated. So the limitation to this study, uh, they only enrolled kids who had isolated lateral ankle findings so if you see something that looks more severe, if you've got findings over the medial ankle or the syndesmosis, or if you think clinically it actually looks like a fracture, then I think you would be reasonable to immobilize it or put it in a cast boot. Uh, so use clinical judgment and recognize that actually most of the people with uh, these suspected uh, fractures in kids actually don't have fractures. And I think... Um, this is perhaps for me the final piece of evidence that we needed to prove that children are in fact just small adults. Okay, move on to case four. Actually the same case because as you're giving this mother discharge instructions about her daughter's ankle injury, she says, oh, well, doc, uh, actually what I was really concerned about today uh, was that during the game, uh, my daughter also hit her head. And since she's arrived in the emergency department, she seems slow and irritable, and she has a headache. I don't know if this has ever happened to anyone where you've completely dealt with a problem, and then the patient says, oh, there's something else I wanted to ask you about. So the question for you is, does this child have a concussion? And what would you like to do to treat them? Okay, so this study gets the award for the worst study title of the year. I think it would be fine if it was a nocturnal enuresis study, but um, it's actually a study about concussion. There we are. So um, these authors, uh, this I think is also a Canadian study from the PERC group, uh, nine sites across Canada. So these authors um, mention that we have these guidelines, 
know, the Zurich guidelines, and they tell us that lots of people have concussions. And based on no evidence whatsoever that patients with concussions need to rest until they're better. So uh, the intention here is to study the link between early activity within the first seven days of a concussion to see whether that's associated with persistent prolonged post-concussive symptoms at one month. So it's an observational study. Uh, they didn't randomize patients to no activity versus high activity, uh, but they looked at patients who were active within seven days and then tried to see whether they were more likely to have uh, adverse symptoms at a month. So the exposure in this study is early activity. The outcome of the study is persistent post-concussive symptoms. Uh, they analyzed this association in three ways to try and ensure that their uh, conclusions were robust. And here's what they found. So they looked at 2,400 patients, average age of 12. And this graph with the red bars actually shows the, not the outcomes, but the level of activity uh, of the kids in the study. And what you see is the big bar on the left uh, is 30% of kids did no activity within the first seven days. And the other 70% of uh, patients did some activity ranging from uh, light aerobic activity to full contact uh, competition sports. So being a skeptic, uh, I'm going to assume that all the kids that had bad concussions selected themselves into the no activity group and all the kids with little or no concussion selected themselves into the full competition group. And based on this assumption, I think you could predict the findings of this study, uh, those being that likely patients in the no activity group would do the worst because they have the worst concussions and that patients who uh, were in the full activity uh, group within seven days would have the best outcomes because they hardly had any concussion at all. And uh, in fact, that's pretty much what happened. So here's the, uh, here's the data. And in the results, what you see in the top table, the top table shows that if you had early activity, you had a 19% lower risk of persistent symptoms, suggesting that early activity is good and improves outcomes. Table two, the lower table, shows a, a sort of dose effect uh, with uh, increasing levels of activity leading to progressively better 28-day outcomes. Uh, although when they did a propensity matched analysis, analysis uh, the dose effect pretty much disappeared. So the author's conclusion uh, was that in concussed kids, early physical activity is associated with fewer post-concussive symptoms and that we should be rethinking our approach to concussions. Okay. When I was, uh, when I was looking at this article, I uh, ran upon uh, quite an interesting commentary article from the uh, Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine uh, that talks about the Zurich guidelines. And it says, uh, with no preamble, with kind of no evidence behind it, these guidelines suggest that all sorts of ubiquitous symptoms should lead to a diagnosis of brain injury, which will in turn prohibit the individual from work or play or school. And that maybe uh, using these sorts of definitions, we're actually including a lot of people who don't have brain injuries uh, into concussion management protocols. And uh, I'm going to tell you a, a secret about myself that I've felt inadequate about for a long time. Uh, when I see a patient like this, I don't actually know whether they have a concussion or not. Okay, so uh, there were some issues uh, with the study. First of all, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm not 100% sure we know uh, how many of the patients in the study actually had a concussion. Uh, in terms of the outcome, 
in order to have an adverse outcome defined at 28 days, these patients needed to have at least three persistent concussive symptoms. And I wondered, why not just one symptom? Why, why not if the patient just had a headache? Uh, why, not, why, why would that not be considered a concussion? And it turns out, uh, when you read the fine print, that three is the average number of post-concussive symptoms that an average person without a concussion has. So, um, so anyway, they needed to have at least three symptoms, but it, it suggests that perhaps lots of people who didn't have con uh, adverse outcomes could easily have been classified as having an adverse outcome at uh, 28 days. I think there may be a misclassification in terms of the categories of activity because you know, do, do parents really know whether their kids are doing light aerobic activity or a little more than that or a little less than that? Um, and uh, I, I don't really know how well they were stratified. So uh, the other thing is that they did a statistical adjustment to try and make sure that the patients in these groups were similar at the beginning. Uh, but you can, you can only adjust for variables that were measured and not too many variables were measured. And finally, they didn't actually look at uh, any other intervening um, medications or interventions between 7 and 28 days that could have in influenced uh, how well the patient did. So it's an interesting study that suggests uh, rest is bad for patients with uh, concussions. But I think that uh, based on a whole bunch of uh, potential issues with this study, that it shouldn't really change our management. I think we should tell patients, maybe you have a concussion, increase your activity as tolerated, and perhaps the current uh, concept of concussion protocols may still be reasonable. Okay, case five. You have a patient um, who has a diagnosis of congestive heart failure. Uh, they're short of breath on exertion. They've got PND. They're orthopneic. They have edema, weight gain, elevated JVP. They're hypoxic on room air. Their chest x-ray shows cardiomegaly uh, and a small pleural effusion. You think they need to be admitted to hospital. And uh, the admitting resident tells you on the phone, get the BNP done, then he will see the patient. So this... Uh, this is a study uh, of the effect of BNP on the management of patients with congestive heart failure. So the question here, so uh, big journal, JAMA, and the question is, uh, is it helpful to use BNP levels to guide the treatment of patients with congestive heart failure? And so it's a huge study, 45 sites, uh, about uh, 900 patients uh, who were randomized to get BNP-guided care uh, versus just being treated based on existing CHF guidelines. So these are patients with an ejection fraction under 40%. Uh, they had a high BNP, I guess, to confirm that, in fact, they had the disease. And in order to be eligible for the study, they had to have a prior heart failure event, i.e., uh, the need for an emergency visit or a, a hospitalization. And as I mentioned, they were randomized to get BNP guided treatment or just guideline guided treatment. Primary outcome was uh, a time to event analysis, so a survival analysis. How long was it to the first heart failure admission or death? And to make a long story short, the study was stopped early because there was no difference whatsoever between the groups. Uh, BNP treatment was more expensive based on the fact that it required more clinic visits uh, and more treatment adjustments, but uh, no, other, no other real difference in outcome. So suggests that you know, maybe this test is occasionally useful in helping us making a, make a diagnosis when we uh, don't really know for sure whether this is CHF, uh, but once a diagnosis is made, uh, biomarker treatment does not seem to be more effective than just usual care. Okay, case six. So this is a, 
34 year old man comes into the emergency department with severe abdominal pain and vomiting. Uh, this is his third uh, episode in the last six months. And on the last two occasions, he was hospitalized. The nurse comes out of the, the room and rolls her eyes at you and says, this guy's a frequent flyer. He's looking for drugs. Your tentative diagnosis is cyclic vomiting. I imagine uh, probably all of you are seeing this. Uh, I think I'm seeing more and more and more of this. And I think that uh, probably I'm going to see more yet with the new cannabis legislation. Um, so anyway, this is probably uh, THC related uh, ca cannabinoid emesis. What, uh, what do you treat it with? I mean, these guys, you know, to their credit, actually often get really sick. Uh, I've seen some amazing electrolyte uh, disorders in these guys, and they're difficult to treat. They don't seem to respond to a lot of the normal things. So I was intrigued when I saw uh, this systematic review uh, in 2017 and uh, it's, a, it's a quite a useful review. It talks about the diagnostic criteria for cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So most of these you're gonna be familiar with. Uh, regular cannab cannabis use for any duration, at least weekly. So there's lots of people out there who are at risk. Cyclic nausea and vomiting, symptom resolution after stopping cannabis, although that always doesn't, doesn't always happen very quickly after stopping cannabis. Hot baths reduce symptoms, mostly in males. Most, most of these people will have abdominal pain as well as vomiting. The physiology, very unclear. I don't know if anyone understands this particularly well. And I just pulled together the recommendations from this uh, review articles and uh, there's a, a couple of uh, very interesting, useful recommendations, and I've shifted my treatment to, uh, well, number two and three. Clearly, these guys are going to get IV fluids, but I, I do feel like uh, IV Haldol uh, works better than on Danzatron or Maxaran or Gravol or the things that we usually use, and I've now seen several patients who seem to resolve uh, when you rub a tube of capsaicin cream over their abdomen. Uh, and uh, yeah, anyway, this, this does actually seem to be useful. So uh, some of these are going to be different treatments that you haven't tried. And uh, a reminder, when you see somebody with uh, kind of a history of cyclic vomiting, think about THC. Okay, next case. Uh, 62-year-old male has a syncopal episode at a restaurant, and his uh, wife brings him in by car. He feels odd. And so what you're seeing here, I think, is a regular wide complex tachycardia at a rate of about 150. So we could debate, is this uh, SVT with aberrancy, or is it VT? But let's not do that, because it's not really the point of uh, this article, and uh, probably in this case, you're going to say usually it's VT, and you're not going to get into uh, trouble by doing that. So this is a really interesting article uh, published in the European Heart Journal. Uh, it is uh, procainamide versus amiodarone in stable wide QRS tachycardias. So this was a randomized trial. It took them six years and they didn't even get to their full sample size enrollment. So it's not a really common syndrome. And I think I've probably only seen a few of these in my career. Uh, so these patients had to have a regular rhythm more than 120 beats per minute, uh, QRS more than 120, and they had to be stable, meaning that they weren't hypotensive, dyspneic, underperfused, and weren't having severe angina. It's a Spanish study, a randomized trial, and these patients were randomized to amiodarone, um, 10 milligrams per kilogram, or procainamide, five milligrams per kilogram, uh, both given over 20 minutes. Their primary uh, outcome was ascertained within 40 minutes, so uh, basically, they watched what happened to these people during the 20-minute drug infusion, 
and for 20 minutes after the drug infusion. Uh, but in addition, all of these patients were observed for 24 hours uh, to look at their outcomes. Okay. Primary outcome was a major adverse cardiac event. Uh, so a major adverse cardiac event meant uh, their tachycardia got worse. Uh, they went into torsades. Uh, they became significantly hypotensive or they developed acute CHF. Interestingly, the secondary outcome uh, was, did they have a successful conversion to sinus rhythm? Okay, let's see what happened here. Okay, so primary outcome, uh, the most impressive thing to me is how bad amiodarone did relative to procainamide so major adverse uh, cardiac events uh, in 41% of amiodarone patients versus 9% of uh, cocainamide patients. Uh, and I think those were mostly hemodynamic deteriorations. Uh, twice the conversion rate in cocainamide, so 67% successful conversion with cocainamide versus 38% with amiodarone and about twice the rate of adverse events within 24 hours in the amiodarone group. So the author's conclusion, uh, cocainamide is associated with less adverse cardiac events and higher rate of conversion, uh, and therefore that cocainamide should be the drug of choice for stable VT. So there's some problems. It's, um, it's a small sample size, uh, but it is still uh, by far the biggest study of uh, stable wide complex tachycardia that's been done uh, to date. So it is the best uh, evidence available. Uh, it was an unblinded study, but uh, did have objective outcome definitions that would be uh, difficult to mess with. Uh, some some uh, people in uh, letters to the editor suggested, yeah, you should have given the amiodarone slower and you should have given a lower dose of amiodarone and that's why you had uh, adverse effects in the amiodarone group. But presumably if you gave lower, slower doses of amiodarone, it would have been even less effective. Um, so uh, interesting study, probably the best evidence and suggests that maybe procainamide is a, is a better drug in this situation. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, before you decide how to treat this patient, he deteriorates into a pulseless ventricular fibrillation. Uh, CPR is started. He gets three shocks, but these are unsuccessful. So you now have shock-resistant ventricular tachycardia. And that takes us to the next study. Another amiodarone study. So this is the ALPS study, amiodarone lidocaine or placebo for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, so this study was uh, done at, uh, I think, about 10 studies across North America. Um, and uh, one of the sites was, in fact, in Vancouver here. Uh, Jim Christensen was uh, one of the authors. So it's a double-blind randomized trial. Uh, they looked at pre-hospital patients who had persistent ventricular fib or VTAC after at least one shock. Patients were randomized to get amiodarone, a lidocaine, or a placebo. Uh, their primary outcome was survival to discharge. Secondary outcome was a positive um, neurologic outcome. So. <clears throat> These authors, I think, felt like, you know, because all of, all of the studies so far seem to show that ACLS drugs don't work, maybe if we do enough studies, we'll eventually get a positive one, and then we can say we have an evidence-based therapy to use in cardiac arrest, or at least a evidence-based drug therapy to use. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, to make a long story short here, uh, no difference in the main outcome. Uh, so placebo, lidocaine, amiodarone, not statistically different in terms of survival. Uh, you could say maybe there's a slight improvement uh, with both of the uh, antiarrhythmic drugs versus placebo. Uh, 
about a maybe 2% uh, improvement. The second line uh, uh, suggests that lidocaine, the ROSC line, lidocaine had slightly better ROSC than amiodarone. And the bottom line in the table suggests that there is a significantly higher survival to hospital with both lidocaine and amiodarone, but again, no difference in survival to discharge and no difference in positive neurologic outcome. So in, in discussing this, uh, one of the limitations that the authors themselves bring up is uh, they think, well, we actually didn't study enough patients and maybe there is an effect size, but it's just very small. And so we probably should study uh, at least 9,000 patients in order to be able to find a significant improvement with these drugs. Uh, another possible concern uh, is the time that it took to administer the drugs. So these were out of hospital uh, cardiac arrest. So there clearly there's a delay to ambulance arrival and a delay as they go through their arrest algorithms. But it was about 19 minutes from arrest to drug. And so the authors speculate that maybe if the patient arrests in front of you, and maybe if you can give them an antiarrhythmic immediately, that these might be uh, more effective. So I think the bottom line is we still don't have any evidence that these drugs are helpful. Uh, you can use them or not use them, uh, but I would uh, probably agree with the authors that it's reasonable to continue studying these given in different, different ways and perhaps with much larger studies. The other question that came to my mind is why does everyone love amiodarone? This is the Kardashian of the antiarrhythmic world. Uh, and looking at the evidence, it's done way better. Uh, it's, it's, it's batting way up, way better than it should be. Uh, this drug is not the best at anything, and yet it uh, is in all of the guidelines. So fortunately, even though we know it's not the drug of choice for atrial fib, <clears throat> atrial flutter, or stable ventricular tachycardia, even though there's no evidence of benefit <clears throat> for, of amiodarone with VT, VFib, or rest, uh, you'll be happy to know that there are some things that it's helpful out there. It's very, it's very good for as an engine degreaser. It's uh, excellent if you've got pesky rats or in, insect infestations and it's a great radiator antifreeze. Okay. Trimethoprim sulfa for skin abscesses. Uh, so there's been a little bit of controversy. The, um, the historic teaching uh, forever is that antibiotics are not useful for abscesses. Uh, recently, some studies suggesting antibiotics might be useful for abscesses. So this was actually a, a New England Journal study uh, from Dave Tallon, who's an emergency physician primarily. Uh, and the objective is to look at the role of antibiotics after in incision and drainage of abscesses. So a multi-center, double-blind trial of uncomplicated abscesses. Uh, so these abscesses had to be at least two centimeters in size. And uh, so after incision and drainage, patients were randomized to get um, double dose trimethoprim sulfa uh, for seven days uh, or placebo. Now by double dose trimethoprim sulfa, it's actually like double the usual double dose. So it's not one double strength tablet BID, it's two double strength tablets BID. And these patients had follow up at uh, half a week at seven to 10 days, and then between two and three weeks. Uh, and their outcome was a clinical cure between seven and 14 days. They defined a clinical cure as the absence of treatment failure. So as the absence of fever, increasing redness, tenderness, and swelling. So basically, if the patient was doing well, that was a clinical cure. And here's what they found. 
Uh, they found a statistically significant uh, improvement in the clinical cure rate with antibiotics. So about a 7% absolute improvement. Uh, and so it was statistically significant. Interestingly, there was no difference in any of the component outcomes that determined clinical success, yet the overall cure rate was improved in the antibiotic group. So this would suggest that maybe there is a role for antibiotics and that you will improve the cure rate uh, if you treat the post-IND patient with uh, trimethoprim sulfa. Um, my main concern, I, I think, uh, in reading the data from this study is that the, <clears throat> the average uh, diameter of erythema around the abscesses in this study was seven centimeters. So that's a huge amount of redness for an abscess. And it makes me think that many of these patients they were treating uh, actually had cellulitis in addition to an abscess. And so likely the benefit of the antibiotics was probably in the patients who had cellulitis and not in all the patients, although uh, they didn't do uh, a subgroup analysis based on the diameter of erythema. So I can't say whether that's actually the case or not. The other thing that was interesting in this study is the incredibly high rate of adverse events uh, in the placebo, placebo group, almost half of the placebo recipients had adverse drug events. Um, so I emailed the author to see if he could explain why this was the case. And it turns out they were using amiodarone as the placebo. So uh, that might also explain some of the findings here. Okay, next case. This is a 46-year-old gentleman who comes in with back pain. He's got lots of stigmata of alcoholism. Uh, he's got cirrhosis. And he says that his doctor usually gives him oxycodone for his back pain. Uh, he's not allowed to take Tylenol or anti-inflammatories because of his underlying cirrhosis. So what are your options to treat this patient? OK. Uh, it's kind of difficult, and I have to say that in this situation, a patient with cirrhosis, I have tended to avoid Tylenol uh, and maybe, uh, you know, leaned towards uh, opioids. So this, uh, this actually isn't original research, but it's a review article in the New England Journal, so I think it comes from a credible source. And uh, what the summary of the article was, uh, yeah, there's lots of drug problems associated with cirrhosis. You shouldn't be using NSAIDs because of uh, AKI and GI bleeding risk. Uh, if you give opioids, you, you may put them into hepatic encephalopathy. That tramadol is safe in low doses. That topical agents like diclofenac are safe. And in fact, that Tylenol is effective and safe. Uh, in a dose of four grams per day. So essentially a normal dose of Tylenol is safe in patients with cirrhosis. Uh, the authors note that some of the hepatologists will reduce the dose of Tylenol, uh, but nobody seems to be saying that Tylenol is not an appropriate analgesic in patients with cirrhosis unless the patient is actively drinking, uh, which, which does seem to increase their risk. So. In this patient, uh, you could argue uh, that no oxycodone isn't ideal because we might put you into hepatic encephalopathy and that maybe Tylenol, Tramadol, or topical agents are preferable. Okay. Optimal ketamine dosing for procedural sedation in kids. So uh, I think over the last two decades, uh, anybody who works in an emergency department has become uh, more and more comfortable with the use of ketamine for procedural sedation. But um, I think lots of people are uncomfortable using higher doses of ketamine. So this uh, study uh, was a, a randomized trial uh, looking at what is the right dose of IV ketamine for sedation. And so they randomized uh, kids uh, who got ketamine for procedural sedation uh, 
to one milligram per kilogram, 1.5 or two milligrams per kilogram uh, of IV ketamine, and then looked at what happened. So uh, bottom line was uh, they were all, um, they all achieved reasonable sedation scores. Uh, the only difference was that the uh, lower dosing, uh, there was a, a much higher risk of the need for redosing ketamine. So in the one milligram per kilogram group, 16% uh, required redosing with ketamine. In the 1.5 and 2 milligram per kilogram groups, uh, they were essentially the same at 3 to 5% need for resedation. Um, so you, you could maybe even argue that the optimal dose may even be higher than uh, 2 milligrams per kilogram IV. Uh, other than that, there was no adverse effects uh, in this study, and the authors concluded that a higher dose of 1.5 to 2 milligrams per kilogram is the appropriate IV dosing. Okay. Next study is about anatomical versus functional testing for coronary artery disease. So uh, clearly in the emergency department, we see a ton of people with chest pain. We refer lots of these people for further uh, provocative testing. Probably most often we send them for exercise stress tests or myocardial perfusion imaging. But uh, particularly in the US over the last five to 10 years, emergency departments are increasingly moving to cardiac CT, which is a kind of a trendy new thing that gives, gives you excellent pictures of coronary arteries. So previous studies of cardiac CT show that uh, these tests seem to lead to more invasive downstream testing and more interventions, but not necessarily to better patient outcomes. So this is a really large study published in the New England Journal. Uh, it's um, it's uh, 10,000 patients with chest pain, so 10,000 patients with active chest pain. Uh, now these were patients seen in the community in clinics and cardiology offices rather than emergency departments, so they may be a slightly lower prevalence population than what we usually deal with. Um, but I think probably the findings are uh, useful. So they, they randomized the 10,000 chest pain patients to get either a cardiac CT imaging or uh, old fashioned functional testing, which could have been a stress ECG, uh, myocardial perfusion study or echocardiogram. Primary outcome was death, MI uh, or uh, an ACS hospitalization or a procedural complication. Okay. So uh, again, uh, bottom line here, just to simplify it, no difference in the primary outcome. Uh, so no difference in uh, death, re uh, in, in the base, basically major uh, adverse cardiac events. And like previous studies, what it, what it shows is uh, in the group that got cardiac CT, more catheterizations, more revascularizations, but no difference in cardiac events. And the authors uh, noted that uh, cardiac CT only increased the cost by $500 per person. So that was really good. Although I guess it could be significant if you multiplied the $500 by a few hundred thousand patients per year being uh, investigated for chest pain. Um, so bottom line, uh, I guess you could go either way if you have access to cardiac CT. Uh, but I think the reason this happened is uh, there's not a great correlation between angiographic lesions and ACS events, because if you think about the pathophysiology of ACS, uh, it has nothing to do with the degree of angiographic occlusion. And in fact, most uh, lesions that cause acute MI are less than 50% prior to the point where the plaque ruptures and they cause the MI. So in fact, um, coronary angiography uh, will often have uh, both false negatives and false positives. And um, in many ways, provocative testing, whether it's stress testing or perfusion imaging, 
uh, may actually give you just as good and uh, equally predictive uh, uh, prognostic information about these patients. So I don't think this study really tells us that one uh, route is better than the other, but I think it tells us that at least there's no evidence at this point that cardiac CT would be considered a diagnostic advance uh, in the investigation of patients with chest pain and possible ACS. Okay, case nine, I think we're getting close to the end here. Uh, I probably have to speed through a little bit. So 11 year old child presents with abdominal pain, looks well, has right lower quadrant tenderness, ultrasound shows a swollen appendix and he gets a diagnosis of appendicitis. The surgical resident who is uh, working with you uh, in the emergency department on an off service elective suggests this patient would be perfect for a non-operative approach. So what do you do? Because there's been uh, several recent studies that suggest non-operative management of uncomplicated appendicitis is quite good. So this study, uh, also 2017, is an administrative database study. And what they did is they looked at uh, 45 pediatric hospitals, so a pretty large number of patients. And they looked for patients who had a diagnosis of appendicitis under age eight, 19, who did not have surgery and who did have antibiotics. Uh, then they looked at uh, whether these patients got subsequent imaging, whether they uh, returned to the hospital, whether they got readmitted, and whether they had surgery uh, subsequent to their discharge. So here's what happened. They looked at 100,000 patients, so a huge number of patients. Uh, uh, Two-thirds of the 100,000 were non-perforated, therefore were eligible for the study. And during the one-year follow-up of non-operative patients, uh, the non-operative patients had more uh, ED revisits, uh, more hospitalizations, uh, about 50% more hospitalizations, and almost half of them required uh, an, uh, an appendectomy. And the appendectomies that happened usually happened within one day. Uh, so these were early appendectomies. These weren't people who got better and then subsequently had a uh, second attack of appendicitis. So uh, there were so many patients returning early on uh, and getting appendectomies. It makes me wonder whether in an administrative database, you might be looking at patients who were maybe sent home and told, we think you have appendicitis, but it's three o'clock in the morning and you should return in the morning. Uh, it also makes me wonder whether these patients, when they returned to the emergency department, uh, maybe just the fact that they returned uh, led to an appendectomy and perhaps they would have done uh, okay without one. But the bottom line here is that uh, a lot of non-operative patients did not do well and almost half of them uh, required an appendectomy, mostly early appendectomy. So I think uh, clearly the Prior evidence suggests that you can use non-operative patient management in selected patients, but I think I would never do this without having a surgeon involved immediately uh, in the emergency department. Okay. I'm gonna skip through this slide, antibiotics versus surgery. It's pretty much the same conclusion. And this is the last study I want to talk about. And I think this is a really interesting, potentially practice changing study. So the, the case, a healthy 54 year old woman uh, recently flew home from Europe. Now she's developed right sided pleuritic chest pain and some mild flu symptoms. Her husband is concerned about a blood clot. She looks well, you actually think maybe she has a viral illness. What do you do? Chest X-ray, D-dimer, CTPE, uh, or none of the above? This uh, published in The Lancet uh, is from the Netherlands, uh, simplified diagnosis of suspected PE. So these authors, um, uh, you know, kind of acknowledge that the way we diagnose PE, if we can find a low risk patient and a negative D-dimer, that essentially rules out PE. 
The problem is the risk models like the Wells score, they're kind of complex. And in reality, physicians don't usually use them. So these authors are suggesting an abbreviated Wells score to identify low risk patients. And then they're using that with a variable D dimer cutoff. So their criteria, the modified Wells criteria, they've cut it down to three criteria. So uh, the criteria are positive if they have signs of a DVT, if they have hemoptysis, or if the physician believes PE is the most likely diagnosis. Now, if you think about these criteria, if you've got somebody with pleuritic chest pain and they're coughing up blood, they are absolutely getting investigated immediately. And similarly, if they've got a swollen tender leg, they are gonna get investigated. So actually, I think what these criteria come down to are, do you think PE is the most likely diagnosis? If you do, so if these are high risk clinical uh, patients based on these three criteria or basically on whether you think PE is the most likely diagnosis, then you have to use a low D dimer cutoff of our current D dimer cutoff of 500. But if you, if you think if you think the patient is a low risk patient, uh, then values up to a thousand on the D dimer would be considered negative. So you're using a low threat D dimer threshold for high risk patients and a high threshold for low risk patients, which is very logical from a diagnostic testing perspective. So big study, um, 3000 some patients, uh, and I'll just skip ahead to the results. And so here's what happened to the, uh, uh, well, this is actually their uh, process. So they take the patients, uh, if they are positive for those three criteria, uh, then you use a low D dimer threshold to determine whether or not they need a CTPE. And if they are negative, if you do not think PE is the most li likely diagnosis, you use a high D dimer threshold to, to determine whether or not they need a CTPE. And then they follow these patients for 90 days uh, to see how many uh, diagnostic failures occurred. So the results uh, using the year's criteria, so basically half of the patients were thought by the physicians not to have PE Half the patients were thought to have uh, a PE. And if you look at the uh, numbers on the sides, what you see is that the physicians were extremely good at risk stratification. So in the group that they thought did not have a PE, only 3.2% of patients were PE positive. In the group where they thought the patient did have a PE, 23% were positive. Uh, and then using those thresholds, they, they sent uh, patients for CTPE or not. And bottom line, ruled out PE in 85% uh, of cases. Uh, and their uh, positive rate on CTPE studies was 27%, which is in the middle of the slide there. So I know in Calgary, our, posit our positive rate for CTPEs is about 17%. So this uh, algorithm seemed to be ordering significantly fewer uh, CTs and their failure rate, their, potentially, their potential miss rate for uh, PE was 0.61%, which is below the, mm, I guess, accepted 2% uh, failure rate for PE. So this, uh, this looks like um, maybe a more simple algorithm it looks like it's quite safe, and it looks like you will order fewer CTPE studies if you do it. So it's one study. It ideally should be validated, uh, but it's really intriguing, and I would actually like to study this in, uh, in Calgary. Hey, Grant, hey, Julian. Gonna... Julian. Stop uh, there and just go to my summary slide. Uh, so oxygen treats hypoxia. It doesn't treat MI. Uh, kids can sprain their ankles. In fact, that's usually what they do. BNP, not so helpful in guiding congestive failure management. 
Uh, that patient with cyclic vomiting, think about THC, try Haldol and capsation topically, not the Haldol topically, but the capsation topically. Amiodarone is not the best drug for Your call anything. Will be disconnected. Uh, you can oh. use Tylenol or maybe Tramadol and cirrhosis. 